so we're no longer taking the uh, fact that summer has begun on begun on faith. Uh, it's pretty warm out there, I think. Well, <laughs> warm for for us anyway. Yeah, well, you know, I spent uh, I was in the uh, backyard, actually, finally getting a chance to brew. It was uh, a whole seventy nine degrees out yesterday. Yeah, and my cherry oatmeal imperial stout will be ready just in time for summer to end. Now, if you believe that our statement about faith and meteorologists is religious, you can give us a call. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And with me today, as usual, is Mike Gillis. How you doing? Uh, all right, I guess. <laughs> right, yeah, I, I can understand that. And uh, finally, deigning to accept a title from us lowly types, assistant producer Becky Friedman. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> So uh, get this out of the way right away. Uh, right after the show, we're going to be heading up to uh, Renton, Washington, to have a sort of post-show shindig with the Auburn, uh, Auburn Free Thought Society. We will be at a terrible beauty at uh, 201 Williams Avenue South in Renton, Washington. And that's a restaurant, Irish pub, all sorts of good eats there. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it should be a good time. So, uh, yeah, come on out and join us. Now... We do have a new segment. Well, I'm not, I'm not, we've been doing it for a few weeks now. Well, but, uh, it's, it's new-ish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, scripture says what? what? So b- basically what we're doing is we are taking a look at our holy books. Uh, we're talking about the Bible, Book of Mormon, the Quran, Bhagavad Gita. And uh, these things are supposed to be these fountains of wisdom. And obviously sometimes there's stuff in these books that... Looks like something out of a Sam Peckinpah movie. <laughs> so what we're going to do is take a look at the funny, the scary, and the just plain weird uh, passages of these books. Uh, this one, uh, this week, actually came from our very own Rich Lyons, our uh, good friend of Living After Faith uh, fame. Yep. It comes from the Quran, chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. And it says as follows. Don't bother warning the disbelievers. Allah has made it impossible for them to believe so that he can torture them forever after they die. Oh, goody. Wow. Okay. This is sort of uh, similar to, in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Yeah. But this is kind of an Allah hardening uh, the atheist's heart. Yeah, this seems... Just for his own fun and amusement. It does seem a bit more intellectually honest, I think. You know, is is we need... We definitely need to have an us-versus-them mentality in order to thrive, because that's something that religion has needed. That's, it's part of human psychology. There's in-tribe, there's out-tribe. And this is just somebody says, is, you know, yeah, we need an out-tribe so God can torture them and we, you know, can dislike them. That's sort of like how the Aztecs didn't conquer certain smaller groups so that they could have somebody that they could sacrifice to their gods. Exactly, exactly. But, but the, the thing that I find kind of quizzical about this is at the same time, they are largely a, an evangelical-style religion. Their their goal in the end is, is to make everybody a Muslim the same way that Christians want everyone to be a Christian. Make right. people true believers in Allah. But here they're actually kind of breaking from that and simply saying, you know what, don't even bother with these people. Uh, God already put a firewall in their head. He made it impossible for them to do the very thing that they would need to do to avoid being punished forever. Yeah. That's a little mean. <laughs> <laughs> even even by Old Testament standards, God's kind of an ass. I and I don't really understand how I'm how I can even perceive of religion as something that can create a future society that is peaceful in which people can all get along when the person who you know, the entity which created the universe has created entities that don't agree with you specifically so that he can torture them. Yeah, and that's I, right in the base source material. Yeah, I think this is a case, um, and we, we talk about this a lot. the The fact that uh, these gods tend to be created in the image of the the men who create them, yeah. rather than the other way around, and it really goes into what our mentality was in the fifth century. Right, right. And this is this is brutal. I know that most Muslims are not uh, violent warmongers and things like that, but you know what, your book is not. Your yeah. book is very violent. It is not a religion of peace. Thankfully, well, you most know, Muslims are. Yeah, well, we, let's go from one quote-unquote religion of peace to another quote-unquote religion of peace, both of which, both of which is crap. And, uh, well, all eyes in the religious world are on Spain this week, as we have, a, uh, as we have this particular news story. Indeed they are. Uh, the Pope has been visiting Spain in honor of World Youth Day. Um, and the funny thing that has happened here is that church leaders have ordered that anyone confessing during this event to having had an abortion, which ordinarily is a sin punishable by excommunication, 
communication should be welcomed back into the church. And we have the Pope's spokesman, Father Federico Lombardi, who says normally only certain priests have the power to lift such an excommunication. That's that's priests at like level six and above, I believe. Right, right. It's an it's an epic class, is what it is. And he continues, but the local diocese has decided to give all priests taking confession at the event this power. Um, and so they've set up what they've done in Madrid is set up uh, hundreds of of uh, confessional booths that look sort of like a, st- uh, a state fair booth. <laughs> visiting thing. It's very funny. And Next then, to the porta bodies. Exactly. And the pump sinks. And uh, surprisingly, both of these booths are full of the same thing. <laughs> Nice one, Mike. Um, really, they say that the, the driving force behind the deal is uh, the Archbishop of Madrid, Antonio Maria Rauco Varela, um, who persuaded the Vatican to offer women who had the abortions access to, quote, the fruits of divine grace that will open the doors to a new life. There is a bit of an irony here. Yeah, I mean, the name, yeah. World Youth Day. I, I, I would think, after the past, what is it, 10, 15 years at this point, the Catholic Church would distance itself from Youth Day. Yeah. But uh, I think the thing that makes, uh, that I find the funniest about this story is them giving powers to these lesser priests to excommunicate. And my first thought was an immediate bloodless coup, that they immediately start <laughs> excommunicating everyone above them and then just take power. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. I think um, if they're just going to suddenly start absolving people for having abortions, maybe they should consider just not concerning themselves with uh, people's bodies quite so much. Why don't we, uh, why don't we take it to some emails? Okay, sounds All right. good. Our first email comes from David M., and uh, he writes about being an atheist in Jerusalem. Being an atheist in Israel is not as hard as I'm sure it is in other parts of the world. I think maybe it is because Jews have never been very good at evangelism and try to convert people to their religion. However, there are certain things that annoy and irritate me. To begin with, the name they have for us is... uh, Becky, you want to give me a hand on that? Chilonim. Yeah, that. Means empty vessel. This is supremely offensive, in my opinion. I'm not empty, I'm just full of other things, not just God. I've got to be careful with that statement, because they could... (laughs) What are you full of? (laughs) Ah, here we go. Uh, There's also the perception that by being an atheist, I'm betraying my tribe. Jews, by necessity, have developed a very us-against-the-world attitude. Again, what we were referring to earlier with that in-tribe, out-tribe. Exactly, exactly. This has been imposed on us by centuries of persecution, and throughout history, religion has been the one thing that has kept us united against adversity. An atheist Jew is seen as offensive to the memories of those who died in countless pogroms and mass exterminations. But what what tribe of people throughout all of human history hasn't been subject to some level of persecution? Does that mean that I'm somehow bound? I mean, I'm part Irish. Right. The, the crap they took at the hands of the British. And the, the British have pretty much just effed everyone in the A at some point. Yeah. So the, the thing that I'm wondering is, do I have to, to speak Gaelic? Do I have to uh, worship... Do I have to be a Catholic because I don't like the British? I mean, how, how much am I chained to the... the the things that happened to my ancestors, and when am I allowed to make my own path? Sure. And, you know, there's, there, I've actually met that guy who says, yeah, you need to learn the language and be a part of your culture if that's where your, where your blood comes from, because blood is thicker than water and thicker than ideas and whatever. And I, I find that very strange. I mean, That's sort of a very unthinking um, asser, uh, assertion to make. Yeah, yeah. Is, is my, my thing has always been to make... Not so much to, you know, I'm not a, against the concept of tribalism. I just, my, my, my question and my quest is just to make the tribe a little bigger. And wouldn't this same mentali- mentality about having to do everything and have the same enemies and the same sort of us versus them mentality also apply to the persecutor in this place? And doesn't this just cement these old tribal bloody conflicts right. into the future? I think that in the case of Israel, uh, that a case can definitely be made given uh, the second intifada that uh, has been going on for the last 10 years or so. I, I really like how David ends his, uh, his email. He says, lastly, and perhaps most important of all, and I question the importance, the actual importance of this, but to each his own. There is nowhere in this town where you can get a decent pepperoni pizza. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That dietary restrictions are pretty much universal there, you know, because they won't sell it. But indeed, no. Oh, well. why, why, why? I mean, are somebody just not allowed? I don't know enough about uh, Israel that I can. I say, I, you ha- I mean, you should be allowed to sell pork products. They're just not very popular. 
I don't know very much about this. Can you? Can you? Um, uh, the laws of, of kashrut, the dietary uh, purity laws, don't permit uh, certainly um, pork products to be sold. And then, let alone, you couldn't have something like a, like a beef salami, uh, pepperoni kind of pizza because that would be the mixing of the milk and meat. Yeah. Um, so definitely, a lot of the laws um, are in in Israel um, are influenced by uh, religious laws, by, by scriptural laws, by halakha is, is what it is called. Um, and certainly since David is in Jerusalem, um, that is basically where, where, uh, where Jewish law reigns supreme. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, you know, it may be a, it may be a first-rate country, it may be a first-world country, whatever, it may have a great military, whatever, but it's still a religiously dominated country. It sounds like a real touch of theocracy. I mean, yeah. I, I live in a country that's majority Christian, not Christian nation, but majority Christian. Yeah. And I, it seems like if I'm not allowed to eat a uh, cocktail shrimp or a uh, pork chop in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, how is that any different than me in the United States being forced to hold to not working on Sunday or, or not having to hold to Christian blasphemy rules? Exactly. Exactly. So let's, uh, let's, move, let's do this one quickly. Uh, this comes from Kirk, and his question is, if one atheist had two buckets and he, filled, and he filled put water into one of the buckets until it was half full, and then he put water into the other bucket until it was half empty, how many gods would he believe in? Just as our does. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I believe... Um, hey, he gave, it, he gave us the gift of the gun. He told us to go out and, and kill the brutals. I believe the answer is chicken cartouche. I think that I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. Okay. Also, 42. 42. Maybe our listeners might have a, an answer to that one. How many gods do you believe in if you have two buckets half full and half empty? Give us a call, 253-584-1480. And <laughs> ask, what's in that bucket? <laughs> yeah, what, what, what is in that bucket? I think the, the emailer specified water. Okay. Oh, that's right. less fun. Yeah. All right. Pepperoni pizzas. Our next uh, email comes from Luke, and he is an atheist and an anti-theist living in New Zealand. Hey, Kiwis. And uh, he writes, My life with regards to religion is comparable to those living in those, in those secular European nations, Norway and Sweden, for example. I am openly atheistic and against religion, and although some people are a little annoyed that I talk about their beliefs that way, most are annoyed I care and bother talking about a slightly controversial subject. I think about 40% of Kiwis are non-religious, but even though Christians are only just a minority, evangelicals and creationists are a severe minority. I, I think that might be part of the reason why Ray Comfort had to leave the friendly confines of New Zealand and find his way here to the States. Ray yeah. Comfort being one of the uh, most uh, strident and unthinking creationists. I was going to say stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's definitely tried to make a he's tried to make a ministry out of uh, baiting atheists, and it's not really working well, out. We're for the him. only people who pay attention to him. I mean, I mean he's funny. He, he trolls us because we're the only people that respond, us and Kirk Cameron. And what I find so funny about Ray Comfort is when, he, when there's, there's someone that they want to put on TV to hold up a picture of, you know, these straw man arguments about evolution and God, that uh, they usually bring his sidekick on, uh, Kirk Cameron, rather than him. And I find it so funny how, how much that he must gnaw at that because uh, they want Robin on TV rather than Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's busy doing... Uh uh, weird Christian movies these days, isn't he? I, I think so. I think that's what Kirk Cameron is up to. Um, but, it, you know, in spite of uh, the occasional Ray Comfort, I do like, you know, that, that Luke uh, reports that there's almost no discrimination against religious or non-religious people here. So yeah. we do appreciate that um, in, in New Zealand, and I think that that's a, a great way to coexist without that tribalism. Yeah, and he describes his, uh, his family as his mom, his dad, and both brothers are atheists in the sense of being apathetic non-believers, although I have a few vaguely religious relatives and an amusingly slash annoyingly a Scientologist uncle. <laughs> that almost exactly describes my family. It's I want to st I want to start a band called Scientologist Uncle. <laughs> Is it post indie rock or? Uh... If you have an idea of what Scientologist Uncle should do for, as a musical group, give us a call two five three five eight four fourteen eighty, and uh, we'll do a uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. we'll do a quick email here. This is Andrew, and he talks about an atheist ministry. And he says, uh, so I'd like your take on something, maybe an idea for a topic for a show. I recently got myself ordained on the internet. Got my certificate and my card in the mail, and my wife got me a minister's shirt and collar. Congratulations. Yeah, I, I know a little bit about that. Some friends of mine asked me to marry them, which is what prompted this ordination. My friends wanted a secular wedding, and I can do that, which got me pondering. I'm a hard atheist. I would even say I'm an anti-theist. But as critical as I am about religion, one of the things I think religion does well is give people a way to celebrate life's milestones. Indeed. Births, deaths, marriages 
altars, etc., are all ceremonies dominated by religion. Perhaps this is because there's really little alternative. Perhaps we need atheist ministers. Uh, you disagree. I do. I don't think we do because I think a minister, not just a, a teacher or somebody who, who basically is a, an MC for things like this, it sort of implies a shared mythology or a shared belief system, and atheism is, is vaguer than that. I could understand a humanist chaplain to some degree, because at least there's humanism is a worldview, and it is a philosophy. Atheism isn't, and I guess I don't want that kind of leadership structure where you have this leadership figure who can be kind of a belief referee. Well, that that's the thing, is I actually tend to agree with Andrew on a couple of points. And the first point is... Uh, you know, there are there is a milestone. There are milestones that need to be celebrated, and there needs to be an easy way to celebrate them. We can't make one. I mean, as we try to get married, it's answering all these questions about how do we do it, what do we do, what do we do with, how do we invite people, and stuff like that. Some of that might be easier if there was sort of an infrastructure for these sort of milestones for atheists. I don't think it's hard to cut the religious aspect out of this. It stuff, hasn't. It, it hasn't been, but there are a lot of questions that I think there there shouldn't be. The other thing is. One of the thing that one of the things that ministry does is, uh, and and Neil Stevenson wrote about this, is that occasionally it was the job of uh, of the mini- of the pastor to go in front of a group of people and say something to make them think on a weekly basis, and that's something I think we need, and that's something I think we do here at Ask an Atheist, and maybe maybe it shouldn't be called um, some ministerial, maybe it shouldn't be pastoral work, but that conversation does need to occur. And I, it, I'm fine with the conversation. I just don't like the idea of one person being the authority. There's, a, why, there's an implied it, authority there. We don't have to. We don't have to accept that. Like we're cutting out the 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 God and the mythology and the supernatural of it all. We can also cut out the authority. And I'm comfortable with cutting out the authority. Somebody who doesn't take their authority from God or from some supernatural disposition means that they have no more truth or no more authority over you than anybody else. I think that this is a <clears throat> excuse me. This is a trend in um, many religious uh, amongst religious communities as well. Of how do we mark these these milestones and how do we come together as a community? Um, and you know maybe they're not as 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 far along as in rejecting some authority um, or the the belief police as uh, as Mike was sort of hinting at. But I know that there have been in the past months um, some exposés about uh, specifically um, pastors in the Netherlands. About one third, up to one third of pastors in the Netherlands are actually agnostics or atheists, and that's a really interesting phenomenon. I find it's an interesting phenomenon. I'd like to hear more about it, but unfortunately, they do have the authority in the Netherlands. They Definitely. have they have the supernat they they lack the supernatural thing, but they do have the authority. And I agree with you, Mike, that the authority needs to go. This is Ask an Atheist two five three five eight four fourteen eighty. We'll be back in a few minutes. Secular humanism is a non-theistic view of the universe built on a foundation of reason, science, and democracy. Humanists support intellectual freedom and critical thinking, and we hold that human beings are autonomous centers of moral development. The Humanists of Washington is the oldest humanist organization in the state and offers a community of free thinkers who educate the public and celebrate life. For information on how you can be a part of the humanist activities in the Puget Sound area, become a member of the Humanists of Washington today. Visit humanistsofwashington.org. The end of the world is now. Millions will disappear in the rapture, and those left behind will feel the wrath of God. So who better to help those people feeling the wrath than an atheist? We don't believe in God, so we're pretty sure we won't get raptured out of here. You can help by donating to Rapture Relief. We'll use the money to help those afflicted during Armageddon. And if for some reason this all turns out to be just another failed prophecy, your money won't be wasted. We'll give it to Camp Quest, which teaches children critical thinking and science so they won't be duped by religious fables in the first place. Learn more at rapture-relief.org. A satirical benefit for Camp Quest brought to you by Seattle Atheists. If you enjoy the programming we create here on Ask an Atheist, please make a contribution with us. Your sponsorship helps keep our show on the air and improve the quality of our broadcasts. Donors get access to exclusive Ask an Atheist content. Don't make us beg. Please go to askanatheist.tv and contribute today. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And uh, we're not done with that atheist ministry conversation, but... uh, 
We're going to have to put that on hold today, or just for a few minutes, because with us is uh, David Work. How are you doing today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, so so uh, you're, uh, you're here with us from rather far away, actually. Yes, I work as a uh, professor of American history in Doha, Qatar. Okay, Doha, Qatar. Yes, in the Persian Gulf. In the Persian Gulf, okay. And that's kind of what today's show is about. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic I'm manifestly unable to really speak about. Well, we've, we've heard a few uh, emails so far about uh, our atheist listeners abroad, and uh, that's what uh, uh, was a precursor to our topic today, godlessness abroad. What's it like for atheists living outside the U.S.? We're in this little corner of the U.S. called the Puget Sound. Um, Sam and I and, and a few other folks on the show here have lived in other areas, um, of the country, but we uh, we don't get out that much. Um, so I, I have tr- done a considerable amount of uh, traveling abroad, but mostly during my uh, uh, the period in my life where I was religiously observant as a Jew. Um, and uh, we're gonna listen to some of our some of our listeners, and certainly David. But first, yeah, what what do you teach out there in uh, in uh, Qatar? Uh, basic U.S. history. Just basic U.S. Yeah, history? just the basic survey courses, which the students need to, uh, to get their degree. So where, where do you, like, pick up and where do you leave off in history as far as? Well, it starts uh, 1492, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes to uh, whenever you can get to, which uh, I usually try to get to the 1990s. Okay, are we still teaching the Columbus end of it, the 1492 thing? Because it seems like, in at least, um, you know, from my external perspective, they're really trying to kill the Christopher Columbus story dead. Well, it depends on the professor. I mean, one of the nice things about teaching at a university is you are allowed to, uh, you know, approach the class however you wish to do it. That's true. And, you know, I approach Columbus as uh, he starts the, uh, the, 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 uh, the exchange between uh, Europe, the old world, and the new world, which is now ongoing, sometimes called the Columbian Exchange. So it, it's the beginning of a, of, you know, a, a world shattering and changing process. Oh, fair enough. Fair so enough. it is proper to, to include Columbus, although to, you know the old idea that Columbus discovered a <laughs> previously unknown world uh, that's kind of yeah has been uh, uh, wiped away. Yeah, uh, appropriately enough. Well, excellent, excellent. And um, you get to the founding of the U.S. and the uh, sort of um, the religious origins of the U.S. versus the separation of church and state and the Establishment Clause and our Constitution and things like that? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, that's a, a major part of the class, teaching about the, uh, the revolutionary period, the creation of the Constitution. Uh, and I do talk about the, uh, the secular, secularization, uh, the place of uh, God. Uh, at the Consti- during the Constitutional Convention, etc. Well, that brings us to a really good question. I mean, why do we get to be uh, godless here in the United States? Well, in the colonial period, most of the, co- the colonies had an official state religion. Uh, Virginia, it was the Anglican Church. Uh, Massachusetts, it was the Congregational Church, etc. Uh, but the driving force, if there was you know, one individual, would be Thomas Jefferson behind uh, this separation of church and state. Jefferson, due to his study of history and being a, a, an Enlightenment philosopher, very much was, wanted to separate them. He was very much opposed to government and the church having anything to do with one another. He believed that it corrupted both of them. Right, right. And so starting in, in the 1770s, he wrote the Virginia... Uh, Statute of Religious Freedom, uh, which in the 1780s was finally adopted by Virginia, which basically said that, you know, you you don't have to be a member of the of a religion to uh, participate in government or live in the state, etc. It basically de-established uh, the the Virginia government, so the Anglican Church was no longer the official church. Right. And this this bill then became the basis of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which in, our, in the U.S. Constitution then does two things. It, uh, it says that government cannot establish a church and that it gives 
religious freedom to individuals. All right, so why don't we take it outside of the U.S. for a minute here? What, uh, Becky, you want to talk about what other sort of models for religion we see outside of the U.S.? Yeah, definitely. There are some countries that have a state religion that's a religion formally adopted as the official religion of the state, and that would be um, Israel and Judaism or Mexico and Roman Catholicism. Obviously, there are people in those states that uh, that are practitioners of other religions besides those ones, or right. even non-believers. There's also a state church, which would be like the Anglican Church um, or the Swe- Church of Sweden. And um, this, this covers yes. a really wide range of, as you were saying, a really wide range of religions. You've got Saudi Arabia, where it is Islam, period, and Islam controls everything. Yeah, other religions are forbidden in Saudi Arabia. Exactly. And, but the, um, in the state religion category, on the other side of that, you have the Netherlands. You have, uh, you know, England and the Church of England. Denmark, Norway, a lot of the northern European countries where the, the state church is sort of a... It's left over it's a, from a, a vestigial organ. Exactly. It's, it seems like there's almost, in this case, there's two routes to secularism. There's sort of the revolutionary path we took and this sort of evolutionary path where the, the state religion just sort of dries up and withers away as time goes I like on. that revolutionary and evolutionary. I mean, certainly in, in France, um, during the French Revolution, there was a, lot, there was a period in time when, when it was uh, uh, predominantly a secular movement. I mean, it was saying, hey, let's not have any religion involved at all. Well, yeah, initially the French Revolution banned the Catholic Church. They closed all the churches. And yeah. they, they sort of turned them into, I guess, secular houses. I can't remember the term they used, but it was very much anti-religion. Uh, which is one of the reasons why a lot of conservative Americans turned against the French Revolution. People like Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, etc. Yeah, yeah. So, and we definitely have some um, some of those evolutionary, you know, sort of secular places where you have republics or monarchies that give constitutional guarantees for, you know, religious minorities. Sometimes that includes atheists. Sometimes that doesn't, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but one of those uh, one of those sort of vestigial. Uh, uh, state uh, state religions um, that's really interesting is Japan, which was a Shinto um, country that uh, was a, was officially disestablished in uh, at the end of World War II. Yes, well, the the emperor of Japan was a divine figure. Yeah, yeah. But to talk about that, we actually have a caller. This is uh, Zach from Maryland, and he'd like to talk about atheism in Japan. How you doing today, Zach? Hi. How you guys doing? Pretty good. Uh, so, uh, what do you have for us? Uh, well, I was recently um, studying abroad in my junior year in uh, Japan this past um, January through March up until the earthquake. Oh, wow. Um, did you leave right before the earthquake, right after the earthquake? or I left about a week after. It was, uh, it was a, a crazy mess to get to the airport, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, it sounds like you got home safe, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was in Tokyo, so I was largely unaffected by... Oh, uh, right. Yeah, so we're we're about I guess two hundred miles away maybe, uh, but still I mean you could see you know the convenience stores were empty, uh, the the grocery stores were cleared out and there were rolling power outages, but you know uh, it was a scary time. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard there was some you know infrastructural issues there as well. So, mm-hmm. um, so why don't you tell us about uh, atheism and in Japan? Um, well, actually, I gotta say it was one of the few places I've ever been where I didn't really experience any prejudice at all. Um, <clears throat> there's a large population of atheism in Japan. Um, it's I, I'd say largely atheists. The ones that are Buddhist are... I personally don't have much of an issue with Buddhism. but <laughs> Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, you know, uh, Buddhism is more of a decoration, almost. There's like a lot of uh, really, really pretty... <laughs> temples and, and things of that nature, but it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of practicing of religion going on. I, I had a friend who spent some time in Japan who told me that they celebrated Christmas there, but they celebrated it with uh, whipped cream and strawberry cake, and it was sort of a, it was a completely, you know, secular thing. Yeah, I don't know. I, I actually arrived a week, a week or two after Christmas, so I just... <laughs> okay. So you didn't get that uh, strawberry shortcake treat. I didn't get that strawberry shortcake. Sounds delicious. <laughs> Now, um, in in your experience, sort of in the aftermath of the earthquake, how did uh, how did that uh, 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 you know seem to you? I know that when we go through a lot of natural disasters in the states, we have a lot of you know rallying and praying and prayer vigils and, and things like that. Was uh, what what was it like in Japan? Um, there was, I mean, there was really none of that, and that was refreshing. I to tell you that much. <laughs> uh, by the way, before I really get into it, I wanted to say you guys have a great show, and I'm um, a big fan. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, and actually, I'm I'm an artist, so I do a lot of art a day. And when I do art, I listen to a lot of talk radio. So I've been listening to you guys like three or four hours a day for the past few weeks. Wow, jeez. <laughs> That's a lot of asking atheist. <laughs> it sure is. I'm running out of backlog. You guys have more. Oh, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, what I saw was a lot of people handling the situation in a way that was so efficient. Um, the The government announced there would be rolling blackouts throughout Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of power consumption, because of the Fukushima plant. Um, And I found that that people, almost every single blackout that was scheduled uh, was canceled because people were able to conserve on power. It was this very much this sort of feeling where, like, we're in this together. You ask us what we're going to do. We're going to figure it out. Um, There wasn't, like, looting. There wasn't crime. You know, these people, (laughs) as Colbert said, have a fundamental lack of understanding how to deal with disaster. (laughs) (laughs) So would you, would you, Zach, attribute that to um, sort of a, a, a largely atheistic worldview? Or, I mean, when you leave out that, oh, let's rally and pray, is the only thing left to actually rally and be pragmatic? And, and, uh, and I mean, and, you know, it, it's the sort of fundamental difference in the mindset of, like, praying that something will happen and getting up and getting on your feet and getting stuff done, Right, I think. So there's a there's an amount of pragmatism involved. Is it's not going to get fixed until we fix it? Mm-hmm, certainly. No, that's certainly uh, that is part of the 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 humanist actually perspective. Is that you know human problems require human solutions? So I'd say that's definitely right, right. secular. Absolutely. Now, um, outside Japan, there were a few uh, a few um, preachers and pastors who sort yep. of made denunciations, saying that Japan was struck with this terrible tsunami and, and earthquake and nuclear disaster uh, thanks to their um, you know thanks to their uh, their, their godlessness and, and their materialism, yeah. etc. Um, how was that perceived? Um, I mean, like I said, I don't, I barely speak any Japanese, so I, I wasn't really too integrated with the, uh, the local, um, like, mindset. But, uh, I personally was uh, outraged. I mean, yeah, how can you, that's, that's incredibly ignorant and incredibly heartless. And I, I find it, I find it inhuman, really. I tend to agree. It's so many, every time there's this, a disaster, this happened in 9-11, this happened with the flood, the Mississippi flooding, with uh, Katrina. Katrina, Katrina whatever. happened because there was a gay pride parade. Yeah, it, <laughs> it seems to be yeah. a strong it, it, strain it, it, of it, it, Protestant it, it, religion, though, to, to condemn people for these their perceived immorality and to say God is punishing them in this way. It, it, you know, it's yeah, a it, cruel it and un, wanna, an unusual it, it, punishment. It makes me want to grab each of these people by the collar and drag them to every single family that lost someone and say, okay, you tell these people that it's their fault. Yeah, absolutely. The, the separation makes it possible to be that inhuman. I mean, it's... it's absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, I, what? Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, I also want to talk about... Cause when I, I mean, when I got home, I obviously heard a lot of, like, oh, we prayed for you, and, and thank God that, that you're okay. And, and while, you know, of course... That's very lovely, and you know, I, I love these people, and I'm not going to say anything uh, against them or against what they said. Right. But I do want to address, um, like, that mindset. I, I find it, I'm, I'm incredibly confused by it. I think that this is something that we hear a lot from atheists of how, how to, there's sort of confusion on two fronts. One, how to react to someone that says, oh, you're going through a hard time, I'll, pay, I'll pray for you, or you just have to trust in the Lord. Um, sort of the confusion on how, how do I respond to that? And the second confusion is uh, what, how, how could that you know, be in your mind? How, how, uh, how is that supposed to help me? I also think there's well, a cultural component here in that somebody says, you know, thank God you're alive. What they're saying is, I am glad that you're alive, and the supernatural is only sort of accidentally invoked. Well, sure. But, I mean, the, you know, there were a lot of specific, like, we prayed for you and ah, that. Okay. But, and and uh, my problem with that thought is, you know, you have to consider that this God that you're praying to is omnipotent. If right. he is omnipotent, he has every, um, you know, conceivable ability to stop disasters like this. So either he caused it, or he sat there and watched it happen. Yeah. So that, that's how, like, it's, it's so boggling to me. This is one of the reasons that uh, apologetics in the Catholic Church exists, is because uh, faith has never really had really great answers to things like that. So they've had to, they basically had to invent a school of thought that would come up with those answers. Uh, I want to thank you for your call, Zach. Uh, thank you. It was very enlightening. Yeah, well, really quick, can I share um, an analogy that I thought of with you? Okay. Um, like, in that mindset, it's sort of like, you know, if I, if I have a room full of 60 people, Mm-hmm. Uh, and I kill 55 of them. 
Uh, I didn't save five people. That's not like how it works. <laughs> Indeed, Indeed, certainly. Thank you very much, Zach. And, uh, thank you. Thanks for listening to Ask an Atheist. So the other side of that, um, you know, I know there's a lot of people, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that the, there is a significant amount of tribalism in Japan in, in the way we've been talking about it in this show. Certainly. But the opposite end of that sort of pragmatic spectrum is where you've been for the last little bit. <laughs> so what is, what is, what does religion and what is it, <clears throat> what does atheism look like in Connor? It looks to be like the invisible dragon. <laughs> So it's just uh, not around at all. Yeah, one is not a, 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 an atheist out in the open in Qatar. I mean, if you were a Qatari to come out, I mean, Muslims in one, in many Muslims find it impossible to believe that people don't believe in God, so they just find that to be inconceivable. But if a Qatari or any, I guess, Muslim in that part of the world were to, to come out and say, "I don't believe in God," they probably would be risk being shunned by their family. And friends, you know, complete aust- being completely ostracized. Would there be any uh, sort of state intervention or, or, or criminal penalties for that? Oh, uh, there might be if they were vocal about it. If they were, you know, getting in front of crowds and, you know, preaching against God or, you know, or speaking against the Quran, you know, or bashing Muhammad. Right. Certainly then you would have a, the, the, the legal authorities would be brought down upon you since you would be committing blasphemy. And the, which is a crime under uh, Sharia law, uh, or and most the forms laws of are Islamic very law. There, right? Excuse me. The blasphemy laws are very strict there. Right? Oh, most certainly. You cannot, uh, you know, uh, criticize uh, Muhammad. You cannot, you know, let's just say, use an obvious example. You cannot draw uh, a, a picture of Muhammad. You can't say anything inflammatory about him. You cannot, uh, you know, criticize the Quran or anything of that nature. I mean, those are certainly against the law. So if we have any, uh, any listeners in Qatar, we, uh, we are here with you um, in, in spirit and in, uh, in reason. So. All right, this is Ask an Atheist, uh, 253-584-1480. We are talking about uh, atheism outside of the U.S., or if we're less politically inclined, atheism abroad. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Did you know that not a single psychic or paranormal event has ever been reproduced? Have you ever wondered about the effectiveness of faith healing, Reiki, or sports bracelets? Was 9-11 an inside job, or is that all just another unproven conspiracy theory? Come check out the Seattle Skeptics, a group focused on lively debates and a critical examination of pseudoscience, alternative medicine, and anything else that hasn't held up to the light of the scientific method. Seattle Skeptics was created for those who require a higher bar of evidence than gut feelings or blind belief. We're not contrarians or cynics, we just want to see the evidence. And so should you. Check us out at seattleskeptics.org. That's seattleskeptics.org. Tacoma Telematics wants to help you connect with your clients. We can give you a top-notch web presence. Tacoma Telematics can take your website to the next level and make it an essential part of your business marketing, but that's not all. Want VoIP? We've got it, bringing large corporation phone systems capability at mom-and-pop prices. We build intuitive interfaces to help you manage your resources quickly and efficiently. Take advantage of our holistic approach to make your business communication succeed effortlessly. At Tacoma Telematics, we're committed to personal and professional integrity, open communication, and long-term relationships. See us at TacomaTelematics.com. You can advertise on Ask an Atheist on the radio, on our website, and in our podcast. People just like you who have the same interests are listening right now, just like you are. And thousands will download this podcast and listen to it later. If you have a product, service, or idea to sell, people here in the Pacific Northwest and people around the world, thousands will hear your message. Let us help you sell your product, service, or idea. Contact us at advertising at askanatheist.tv. That's advertising at askanatheist.tv. And this is Ask an Atheist on KLAY 1180 AM in Tacoma and Lakewood. And back with us is Mike. Hey. Hey. Extended bathroom break. Yeah, extended bathroom break. But uh, David is also still with us. Hello. And Becky is still here, too. Hey there. This is Ask an Atheist, 253-584-1480. And once again, we will be up at A Terrible Beauty in Renton when this show is over. Now, you've got something you wanted to say about uh, Thomas Jefferson before we moved on. Today you often hear from Christian apologists that although we have separation of church and state and freedom of religion, that we're still a Christian nation and that that was what was intended. Jefferson, in his autobiography, however, very clearly said that his religious bill of freedom applied to everybody. Jews, Muslims, uh, Hindus, infidels was the term he used, which would be atheists. <laughs> yeah. So it was, he did clearly said, we are not a Christian nation. 
it applies to religious freedom is for everybody. That's that's something that I, I find kind of funny is that when you hear some of the fundamentalist Christians talk about the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, that they talk of it in terms of it's okay for us to push Christianity. The thing about establishing a church is making it explicitly Lutheran or explicitly Baptist or Anglican, as if that's really any difference. Like, oh, it's, we have religious freedom in this country. You, you know, it's just not Sunni or Shia. Yeah, but that's exactly what Jefferson was saying. No, we are not a Christian country. Everybody gets religious freedom. So we have it pretty good here in the U.S. uh, where we get that religious freedom, and uh, even us infidels uh, get that. Um, We also know where else do, you know, atheists have it pretty good around the world. We heard from Zach last segment about uh, about how he enjoyed Japan. Um, I wanted to note Australia, that in the 2006 census, about 19% of the population cited no religion um, on their census form, and that includes humanism and atheism, agnosticism, rationalism, and it's actually the fastest growing group um, between 2001 and 2006, and weekly, uh, weekly attendance at church services is down to only about 7.5% per- 7. Of, the, of the population, and of course we know that Australia was you know, a, a protectorate of the, of the British crown right. for a while and so that sort of represents one of those sort of moving away from that official church it is there but it's sort of that again vestigial organ we, we do have an email from uh, somebody who is an australian atheist and uh, well, let's take a minute and read it this is ty and he writes on the social level religion is broadly considered to be a private matter overtly bringing your religion or lack thereof into the conversation is generally considered rude we have to keep, we have a keep it to yourself attitude There is no push that I'm aware of to bring creationism or intelligent design into schools. We do, however, have denominational religious instruction in public primary schools once a week. The parents have to sign off on it, most do, and in my experience, it's pretty moderate, hippie, Jesus, God loves everyone stuff. Most of the class ignored the Ernest Young born again because he wasn't a teacher and none of it was graded. In recent years, Muslim instruction has been introduced as well, and currently secular ethics classes for non-religious students are being trialed. Why do we have to separate these things? That's that's what I'm curious. Why not bring them all together into a academic level comparative religion class? I'm perfectly okay with people going to get, you know, training in whatever religion they choose to be with. That's their right, and I think they should be allowed to do it. Why does it necessarily have to be an arm of the state? Yeah, that's that's my chief issue. It's also interesting to note Australia actually has an atheist prime minister, and I believe her name is Julia Gillard. Yeah. Uh, there is some uh, problem with her among a lot of secular voters, though, that she's a bit too cuddly with their version of the religious right, which most of the time isn't as nasty as ours here in mm-hmm. the United States, but uh, that she is way too conciliatory. Right, right. But th- they do have a religious right in Australia as well. Uh, they have the Family First Party, which I guess is kind of the equivalent of uh, the religious right, just kind of bundled up. But their mainstream conservatism in Australia, though, really isn't the culture war variety, except for that little group. Yeah, I know here in the U.S. there was a there was a class for Catholics called uh, CCD that a lot of people had to go to, and they got on a bus to go to the church. Yeah, but that's an after school sort of activity. The same thing, the same way that I went to Jewish community school. But it was run by the church, and it was I think it was actually school buses that took people to the class. And when I was a kid uh, in elementary school, because of my last name, they automatically assumed I was going to that class. Did and and, uh, did the church actually rent the buses, or did they get them for free? I don't actually know. Because that's, that's kind of the deciding factor for me on whether that's a First Amendment violation. I have no problem with a church renting uh, an auditorium at a school on Sunday mm-hmm. um, to, uh, to have a church church event. But it's, it's when they start getting stuff for free or they have privileged um, sort of positions. I, I do take an issue with that. The same way I don't really like the idea of a school employee providing religious instruction. Yeah. So we have another email, and uh, this is Martin in Germany. Yeah, Martin actually talks about schools as well in Germany, having a mandatory school subject dealing with religion, where he says he editorializes, it wouldn't be bad, except that there are two versions of this subject. If you're a Christian, you have to attend a special subject focused on Christianity, and also other religions are mentioned, he says parenthetically. (laughs) So I wonder how much mentioning those other religions get, and in what context. Um, And then he says, if you are anything else, non-believer, Muslim, Hindu, whatever... You have to participate in the second version of the religious subject, which deals with all kinds of religions and moral questions, and in my opinion, is a good subject. So I think that that's a really neat, um, a neat sort of thing, that, uh, that uh, moral ethics um, and, and sort of human relations and comparative religions class in the public schools would be a really valuable um, expenditure and a very valuable seminar once a week at the primary or secondary level. What do you guys think? 
I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, learning about religions, especially not your own, is incredibly valuable. But just having your assumptions reaffirmed, I don't think you gain anything from that. Well, it's important because religions are so important in the world today. I mean, they always have been, and it's important to know what you know what Islam is like, what are Buddhists like. I mean, how are that? How are they different from Hindus, and how are they different from Christians? Just so in this increasingly interconnected world, you can, if you're in the going to go into business, you can makes you understand your competitors or com- you know, cultures better. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is so much, well, you know, the country we're in is is a secular country. It got there through a long, you know, along a long path. And most of human history has been dominated by religion. And it's interesting to know the basis of those laws, how religion made this law or that law or why this the, these people were strict about one thing and why these people were strict about a completely different thing and it's really hard to understand that without a religious without an understanding of religion so i think comparative religion is an educationally important thing especially because you're you're going to be dealing with other countries on a foreign policy level on a very constant basis and understanding where somebody's coming from makes it a little easier than just to be shocked by some doctrine they throw out that's super important to them and not knowing how to react. But too often, religious, uh, comparative religious study turns into religious indoctrination, and that's where the concern comes in. Well, we see here in both Australia and Germany, there's two religious classes. The Christians get their, their separate ones. So we see here a Christian privilege. In this case, it seems like a vestige. Yeah. And then everybody else gets the, the comparative religion class, which it seems that all the students should have to take, not just the non-Christians. Absolutely. And, David, you were talking about earlier during the break um, to us that uh, sometimes in, in Qatar there is a uh, required comparative religion class, but what does it end up being, really, a comparison between? Well, I, at one of the universities in Qatar, there is a, a Georgetown University. Georgetown in the United States requires its students to take a religious class. And in Qatar, it's a comparative religious class. And From what I'm told, because most of the students are Sunni or Shia Muslims, uh, much of the debate ends up being about the, uh, the, you know, the battle between Sunni and Shia, which is uh, the correct version of Islam, etc. That's just what I've heard. you had a, so everybody else sort of gets uh, screened I'm, out. I mean, it's it's nice that they're not killing each other in this discussion, as sometimes happens. But you know, the same way with you know Protestant Catholic. But it it seems like that's the wrong discussion to have in a comparative religion class. Who's right, rather than treating it like an academic subject? Yeah. Um, our listener, Martin, in Germany also had, a, had an anecdote about something at the university level. Um, he said that in Germany, where about a third of the population are non-believers, um, where it's not really c- hard to come out as an atheist, um, where really, though, in spite of that, religion still has a pretty big sway. He says, for example, I'd like to share an anecdote that happened to one of my physics professors. In 1995, the Constitutional Court ruled that school prayer and religious symbols in the classroom violate the Constitution and are not allowed anymore. I think all of us at Ask an Atheist would give a thumbs up to that. Oh, yeah. Um, Martin continues, everybody knows that, but the majority of schools in Bavaria, where I'm coming from, just don't care and still do it anyway. I think all of us at Ask an Atheist would give a thumbs down to that. <laughs> but we're also terribly familiar with that idea. We're just, you know, when you disagree with the law, to heck with the law. I mean, Indeed. how many news stories have we heard that are exactly like this? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in the U.S., it took until, you know, 20 years after the Supreme Court deemed segregated schools illegal to have full integration. So yeah. that is something that we're familiar with. Um, so the the Martin says, so the school of uh, the son of his professor... Um, and when the professor found out of this, uh, found out about this, he complained and forced them to stop praying and remove the cross. There was an article about it in the local newspaper, and after that, the whole physics department received threatening calls from different people, and nobody took them seriously. But it, Martin says it still shows how this is a sensitive question. That's rather surprising, I guess, coming from Germany, since we don't really hear of that sort of uh, expressive religious bigotry, which I guess is what we would call this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it did. Once upon a time, it was sort of the Holy Roman Empire, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so you think there might be some social vestiges of it somewhere in the? Well, we certainly see that in the fact that they still teach have a separate Christian yeah. uh, class. That's the vestige there. But Germany's had such you know a history of religious conflict. You know, the Thirty Years' War was largely fought, fought across Germany between Protestants and Catholics. That yeah, they've kind of wanted to. You know, maybe we shouldn't uh, fight over this anymore. <laughs> it, I find it kind of funny, though, um, that a lot of times you you don't think of somebody as being overtly religious or zealous 
until you say something that just touches the sore tooth and then stuff floods out of people that you did not expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all too often, religious differences are the floodgates which open, which allow all sorts of social uh, social disorder that would might have been solved pleasantly and in the court system to suddenly just make it into the public space. And even in the United States, what we, we've mentioned several times, it's pretty easy here relatively to be an atheist compared to places where you might end up in a dungeon. But yeah. uh, that that the, the situation that we have, the status quo, is something that we have to constantly defend. And like the situation we're talking about here in Germany, it's stuff where laws are just largely ignored for the longest time. All right, we're going to move on to another country, but not too far away. Becky, what do you have? Uh, we're going to our friend Yardar in uh, Norway, and his uh, subject is An Ungodly Norwegian Tale. Uh, he says that he's a 19-year-old boy, and he's lucky enough to be born in Norway, one of the most secular countries of the world. Your religion is not really seen as a big deal here, and even though a surprising amount of children get baptized and confirmed within the church, it's more often than not being done due to tradition rather than actual belief in what's being said. Perhaps that harkens back to um, what Sam was talking about, a way to sort of mark uh, life milestones. Yeah. Um, uh, Yardar continues, despite the country being as secular as it is, the state church is ironically still a part of it. I remember in my early childhood, we would get priests come into the school and teach us about the cutesy parts of the Bible. Sounds familiar? <laughs> uh, some of that hippie, uh, hippie Jesus stuff? Yeah. Um, it was beyond dull, and I often wish that I could be one of the Muslim children that had the right to stay away from school on those days. Interesting. In Norway, Muslim kids and I guess non-Christian kids just get to skip school. Not just on Fridays? I guess. <laughs> um, in a sense, I'm glad that I stayed, though. Knowledge is power, and getting a general idea of what Christianity is all about has proved useful in discussions about the topic. Um, Yardar then describes how he uh, came to Minnesota on a visit, and uh, he was really uh, struck by the, the comparisons. He says, I soon found myself disgusted by what I was told there at, at a church. The way these human beings submitted and degraded themselves in front of their deity, the way they seemed to demonize the ones who did not share their Protestant values. I even recall the pastor verbally mocking other deities, which furthered my distaste for sermons. And this really led him to a place where he says, eventually I found, my, I found myself in a near anti-theistic position within the U.S., but I knew that attitude was not very beneficial, and I left it at being a vocal atheist instead. So it's sort of an interesting, interesting experience for our young friend Yardar, um, and and many of our listeners may have uh, uh, come across similar situations where you go through a period of being very angry and outraged, um, but then sort of pull back. There is sort of a, a, a grief sort of dealing with phase with atheism when you leave religion. You know, there's the argument, the arguing, the bargaining, stuff like that. I, I have seen that happen. It doesn't take the same path as dealing with death because. It's a little different. It's a self-separation rather than somebody you love passing on or uh, away, whatever. Dying. Dying. I try to be nice sometimes. People die, Sam. I know, I know. I could show you the episode where Mr. Hooper died and they had to tell Big Bird. Yeah, well, they did that. I, if, if we could handle death like that a lot, I think we'd be a lot better off, personally. But I find it interesting, again, that here in Norway, a, a largely secular country, that they're, t again, teaching Christianity in the school. Yeah. I just want to ask you guys a question. Do you think in Australia, Germany, Norway, and these other classes, it's because uh, religion and Christianity specifically is oftentimes equated with morality, so that they're really saying, teaching, well, this is how to be moral? It's, it's kind of funny. I actually had an exchange with a Scandinavian uh, fan of the show over Facebook just a short while ago, and he was talking, I th believe he was from Finland, talking about how they still do have a state church that you are in by default when you're born, and you actually have to opt out of it, right. so you don't have to pay taxes anymore. And I know that there has been a movement from atheists in, uh, I believe it was Finland, please call in if I'm getting that wrong, by the way, <laughs> uh, to change that around so you you actually have to opt in. I mean, this is a church where it's just completely empty on Sundays, nobody goes, but the tax exemption is what keeps them alive. I mean, the tax money they get keeps this church alive, and how they're fighting like crazy to keep their numbers up so they can continue to get money. One of the interesting things there is that a lot of the stuff that would be handled by, like, the Office of the Census here in the United States is handled by that church in that country, so that there actually so much of, of government infrastructure is handled by the, ch by the church. That, that is true, um, but it doesn't really get at David's question about morality and whether the, whether the church or Christianity has 
has a uh, sort of supremacy on, on morality. And I think we sort of see that in a little bit where the Christian uh, classes in the public school are interchangeable with the, with the um, atheist or humanistic morality yeah. and ethics classes. If they're merely interchangeable, we are saying essentially, or that government or that school system are, is saying that the humanistic ethics and values class is interchangeable with the Christian morality and that it is equally... There, yeah, there is morally. something that we're seeing on, like, our, our, the feedback we get online is, that, well, your morality, how can you talk about atheist morality? It all comes from religion anyway. And it completely doesn't. And there's a lot of there's, there's in stuff in history, and they're actually working on a show about this topic. We actually want to do a whole show about how this idea that the morality that we've inherited from our religious forebears comes only from Christianity, and Christianity is the font of this morality, is bunk. It it's is completely untrue. Bunk. I mean, it totally, uh, I mean, it predates these religions. And these religions, I think this is just an expression of Christian privilege right here, where they are just taking the name of their religion and using it as just another synonym for being a good person. Yeah, It's not necessary to be a good person, and it's... It's it's just insane that they continue to just to say, oh, well, you're very Christian. Well, and Yardar finishes up his email, may your show last long and bring food for thought into starving minds. I'm hungry. Uh, what are we going to do? What are we going <laughs> to eat after this? Once again, we are going to uh, Terrible Beauty on 201 Williams Avenue South in Renton, Washington. We're going to be having dinner with the Auburn Free Thought Group. This has been Ask an Atheist, Godlessness, Godlessness Abroad. My name is Sam Mulvey. With me was Rebecca Friedman and Mike Gillis. My special guest is David Work. Our call screener is Darren Garvin. As always, the music was by Chris Coleman. This is a, Ask an Atheist is an NEDM media production. You can give us a call at 206 420 or leave us a message at askanatheist.tv. You guys have a good week.